Well, I am kind of bummed, but kind of excited. Uh oh. Oh. Uh, because we are closing out our sermon series called Thrive, God of Money. So our financial uh, series that we're do that we've been doing. And uh, I'm kind of bummed about it because I'm learning a ton. You know what I mean? <laughs> Part of being a preacher is that you kind of go, okay, what do I need to learn? Yes. Uh, what do I want to grow in? Come on, bro. And then you just preach your quiet times. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. There's nothing better than preaching your quiet. Sometimes uh, I, I'm mystified by I was I follow a couple like mainstream preachers on Instagram. You know what I mean? Just to kind of get the vibe of what's going on and you know pop culture Christianity and so I can preach against it. You know what I mean? Because it's jacked up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some of the stuff and you know some of these really popular preachers do on Instagram. They have these like I'm in an airport. Ask me a question. You know what I mean? Or I'm Bored out of my mind, doing nothing, so ask me a question. Yeah. Right? Oh, wow. And so people ask them questions, okay. and every single one of them, and every single time it happens, somebody says, what's the hardest thing about being a, pre a pastor? What's the hardest thing? Hands down, the number one thing that I see is preaching what? every Sunday. Wow. These guys have to preach wow. once a week, <sighs> maybe twice to three times in a weekend. Maybe they do a Saturday night service and then two Sunday services or whatever. Dang. And I'm going, that's awesome. <laughs> I preach on Sunday. I preach on Tuesday. I preach every other Wednesday. Yeah. I preach on Friday. And then I preach on Sunday. Woo! Oh, oh, right. I can't right. preach the same lesson over and over again. You know what I mean? Because right. I can't do that. That's you know what I mean? Right. Like some people can read, eat, like, can, like preach a staff lesson and then Turn around and preach that to the congregation. Now, I will do that sometimes, but that's just not how I roll. You know what I mean? I got to preach something different. Come on. Uh, so how can you not be preaching your quiet times? You know what I'm saying? Mm. Anyway, I digress. It's, uh, oh, bro. it's awesome. <laughs> but, uh, but it's awesome to be able to preach the stuff that I'm learning, yeah. especially when it comes to money. And Ariel kind of stole a bit of my oh, first point. Oh. I didn't know this, but she did. But, uh, but it's awesome, isn't it? So, turn your Bibles, as we get rolling here, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. You know, we've talked about getting out of debt, we've talked about getting on a budget, we've talked about living uh, on less than you make, saving, giving, all of these things allow us to build wealth. Now, automatically, automatically, as soon as I say the words build wealth, we go somewhere in our minds. Yep, true. <laughs> because wealth to Americans equals lots of money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if we had a bit of an older crowd, I would, you know, start singing that song. I've got money, lots and lots of money. <laughs> and like three of you know what I'm talking about, and one of them is my wife, okay? <laughs> I, don't, I forget who sang that song, but uh, uh, I thought about it. But we have a mentality of what wealth means for us as Americans, and really for us in the first world. You know, we've said that handling money God's way always works. Amen. It always works. God's plan works. And when you handle money God's way and follow his principles... You get to experience his work in your life. Again, this is not magic. It's not prosperity theology. It's none of that. We don't believe in any of that mess here. But it's God doing what God says he's going to do when we do what God wants us to do, especially in our finances. Handling his resources, his way for his glory. Amen. But as they work, we, this typically raises some very important questions that we need to ask, right? How do I keep wealth from ruining my life, right? I'm, I'm afraid of lots of money because I know how greedy I am in my heart. I'm also afraid of no money because of how greedy I am in my heart. <laughs> How do I keep wealth from ruining my kids? Yeah. Yeah. We've all seen the beautiful shows on television yeah. 
or Netflix or whatever, those documentaries, they call them reality TV shows, about spoiled rich kids. Uh. Now, having wealth as a child provides opportunity, but as we'll see later on in the scriptures, we can also, that opportunity can lead to either good or it can lead to evil. Yeah. Yes. And what's been perpetuated in our society is a lot more evil than yeah. a lot of good. Yeah. We don't want to become people who get crazy because we've gained some wealth. And none of us want our kids to become that next reality star whose life is out of control because they don't know how to handle money properly. Right. Today, to wrap up our sermon series on God and money, we'll be talking about the biblical framework for wealth. And that's the title of today's sermon, the biblical framework for wealth. And I have three points for us because we're going to start where it is so important to start, and that's starting with the heart. The heart of wealth. We're going to look at what should our attitude be towards wealth. Then we're going to look at the hands of wealth. We're going to talk about work. And then we're going to talk about the head of wealth. Is it okay to look forward, to, look for, to, to think about retirement, to think about our legacy? Is it okay to do that biblically? Mm. Point number one, the heart of wealth. You know, wealth provided by God can never be evil because God would never promote evil in the lives of his children. Mm. Mm. Next, if wealthy people are evil, <coughs> then we are all evil. Mm. Why would you say that? If you make $34,000, catch these statistics, if you make $34,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of income earners in the world. Mm. Now, some of you are... Poor college students, and thirty-four thousand. Would you be like, hey, I would love to make thirty-four thousand? <laughs> if you make eleven thousand dollars a year, wow, which is below the lowest U.S. poverty threshold, you're still in the top ten percent of the world's income earners. Wow, wow. If you have a computer, a cell phone, a television, a car, you are wealthy. Wow. Wow. So if wealth is evil, you and I have a problem. <laughs> Come on. There are certain critical hearts in our culture wow. that are twisting a biblical perspective on money and wealth. How you feel about what was just said tells a lot about who's indoctrinated you. Wow. Wow. I struggle with this. Like, there's just something in me that just, like, grates against this idea that somehow even us talking about money is evil. Wow. Why? Because we've grown up in churches mm -hmm. that talk all about money. Mm -hmm. And then we see the pastor or the church leader or whoever it is super corrupt. Mm -hmm. or, or super sin. Maybe not even on the money side, but their life is terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and so we, 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 have, we are indoctrinated by a society that tells us all churches talk about is money. Mm -hmm. Now, we do talk about money because Jesus talks about money, and we're going to talk about money. We just so happen to have three, four weeks where we're talking about money every week, a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to not talk about money for the most part for the rest of the year, but we're still going to talk about money every Sunday because mm -hmm. it's important. Right. Because where your treasure is, Jesus says, your heart will be also. That's right, bro. But on the other hand... We've been indoctrinated into a society, not even on the religious side, but on the secular side, mm. that demonizes and demoralizes wealth. Right. Come on, bro. Then if somebody, I mean, if you just look, if you just look at the television shows that are out there, you just look at the narrative around rich people out there. Yeah. People either love or hate Musk. Mm -hmm. People either love or hate Bezos. People either love or hate Warren Buffett. People either love or hate Donald Trump, even before he became a president. Mm -hmm. right. He was polarizing. Mm -hmm. And why? Well, mm -hmm. well, because it's an issue of jealousy and envy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because the hearts of man, the hearts of man are evil. Mm -hmm. And so we've been pressured in between these two perspectives before we even become a real Christian. And churches don't speak, they don't preach, they don't talk about using your wealth biblically. Why? Because they don't use the Bible. Mm -hmm. 
They have a feel-good message about the 12 things you can do to be a great husband, the 13 things you can do to be a great parent. Here's 16 different ways from next Sunday to be able to do blah, blah, blah. Great stuff. Mm. But it's not practical. It's not realistic. They don't help us be renewed in the attitude of our mind. There it is. There it is. As Paul says in Romans 12. We've got to change our perspective. And it begins in the heart. You know the Bible talks about the heart a ton. Now, when we in the Western world think about the heart, we automatically go to either the physical heart or our emotions. Right. That's not a biblically accurate view of the heart. The biblically accurate view of the heart is the seat of thought and emotion. I'm going to use this analogy because it works for me in my brain. It might be a little bit off, but let's just go for it, okay? <laughs> we all are familiar with yin-yang, right? A little black you know, looking tadpole and a little white looking tadpole, right? Yeah. Okay? The heart is essentially the biblical yin yang, the seat of thought and emotion. Meaning that for me, who's an emotional guy, the heart is supposed to go, whoa, Eric, you're thinking a little emotional here. Let's get rational. Let's have a little rational thought. Uh -huh. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so the, the emotions are necessary and important. And so they kick in. And then the mind, right? The thought needs to come in and go, whoa, Eric, chill out a little bit, man. <laughs> it's not all that crazy. Come on, bro. <laughs> Equally, there are people around us who are extremely logical. And so their mind goes out of control. Ooh. And the heart has to come in and go, yo, man, you got to feel a little bit about mm -hmm. this got to think with the heart a little bit about this. Mm. So the heart, in not in our Western culture, but in biblical, uh, biblical theology of the heart is that the heart is both put together. Yeah. It's the place where you think critically, but you also feel. Does this make sense? Yeah. So where my heart is, so is my brain. Where my brain is, so is my heart. They're connected to one another right. from a biblical perspective. Mm. And so we always have to begin... With our thought process, a.k.a. our emotions, a.k.a. our heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These toxic hearts, we're going to look at three. Two of them are toxic. One of them is the right heart that we need to have. These toxic hearts want you to think that if you've experienced a measure of success, you've done something wrong. Oh, that's a good jam. These hearts wrangle their way into our attitudes and cause us to have an unbiblical and godly view of wealth. And we're going to examine them. Let's first look at the heart of pride. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 10. Okay. Luke chapter 10. Look here at verse 38. The Bible says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Many of us are familiar with this story, the story of Martha and Mary how Martha complained about working and how Jesus responded to her complaints. Now, here's what's crazy if you think about it. Here's Martha Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus is teaching. Where is Martha going to come in and talk to Jesus about this? She has to come in and interrupt Jesus from teaching in order, you know, to talk about her sister. Wow. Huh. It's the spirit of pride. The spirit of pride says wealth comes from hard work and is represented by Martha in Luke 10. She was busy with housework, even though God's son was teaching in her living room. It's all about me. It's all about what I can accomplish. It's the hustle culture of our modern age. A lot of us are like Martha. We are performance-based thinkers. And why is this? Because... The business world is performance-based. So you've been indoctrinated 
from the business world with a performance mentality. If I do good, I get raises. I get promotions. I get bonuses. I get whatever it may be. Good things. If I do poorly, if I perform poorly, I get bad things. <clears throat> now, there is truth to this in just our worlds. If you do wrong, you will be punished. If you do good, good things will come to you. That is just built into the fabric of our society. But there is no grace. There is no conversation. I remember when I was a kid, and every Christmas, for many, many years, this plagued me. I hated Christmas. <laughs> How can you hate Christmas? You're an evil human being if you hate Christmas. <laughs> well, I was an evil human being. <laughs> but I remember me and my brother, we would fight over this. We fought over this. I mean, we're twins. Many of you saw the picture. Yeah. Of me, right? We're twins. So we li lived in the same room until we were 16 years old. We, we shared everything. It was just, you know, ridiculous. But, like, we fought over these toys. You know what I mean? And my dad just took him away. Ooh. Took him away. Never to be seen again. No explanation, no nothing. Just gone. <clears throat> and so that really built into me a, like, you better be grateful for what you get. Like, you better, you know what I mean? So when my kids gave even just a smidge of ingratitude, I would be like, what? I'm going to take it away. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, where, where, did, where is this root? And I realized it was because, and it wasn't necessarily the consequence of that being taken away. That was actually the right consequence, in my opinion. Mm. But it was the fact that there was no conversation. There was no training. There was no teaching. There was no, hey, here's why you're getting these consequences. Right. So performance is not a bad thing. In fact, our greatest witness, our greatest evangelistic tool is us being amazing employees. Yeah. Us being amazing citizens. Yeah. Us being amazing students. Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing worse than seeing somebody who's like sharing their faith like a mad dog and they aren't paying their bills or they're a terrible employee. They show up late to work all the time. What kind of witness is that? Yes. Right. Come on, bro. So there's truth, there, there's a good side to performance. There's a goodness to hard work. There's a goodness to being focused on doing things rightly, as Ariel mentioned in the communion. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the glory of God. Right. You know, it says in 2 Thessalonians, writes this down, 3.10. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Yeah. Notice the word unwilling to work. We have a whole mess of society that is unwilling to work. So hold another lesson for a whole other time. <laughs> But we're performance-based, and we like to quote these kinds of scriptures. Proverbs 10, verse 4, write that down. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Mm. Matthew 25, 29. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Look, work is good. Work is necessary. We'll discuss this a little bit more later. Mm. But not at the expense of what is better. Jesus told Martha to slow down and focus on what was really important. Right. This, his presence, and his teaching. Mm -hmm. Like Martha, we can miss something important because we're driven by performance. Mm -hmm. Our pride can distract us from receiving what Jesus wants to give us. How do we avoid the spirit and the heart of pride? We must learn to display grace instead of being driven by performance. Mm -hmm. We need to slow down and sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 That's the first heart. Obviously, that's one of the toxic hearts, right? Do I need to explain that? Okay. <laughs> Second heart, the heart of poverty. The heart of poverty. Go to John chapter 12. I didn't have time in my quiet time, but I'll, I'll have to go back and do this to see if there's a connection between these two events. But we obviously know that Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were like, Really close homies. Mm -hmm. Okay? So they went and hung out with each other a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house was a place where the disciples kicked it off. You know what I mean? Yeah. John chapter 12, look here in verse 1. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. 
Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. When Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Mm -hmm. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Mm -hmm. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. <clears throat> it was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Mm -hmm. Judas represents poverty in this story, while Mary represents gratitude. The heart of poverty says that wealth comes from the devil and is represented by Judas in John 12. It says money is evil and should be avoided at all costs. How do we see this in Judas? Well, Mary had something that was nice, and yet his mentality was not to own nice things, but instead sell it and give it to the poor. Now, later we find out that that was not his intention at all, but at least those were the words that came out of his mouth, giving us an indication of what he believed, at least on some level. Sadly, many Christians have this mentality. We shouldn't have nice things. Mm. But instead, we should give all our money to the poor and to the mission of Jesus. Mm. Now, that's a very noble thing to say. Mm. Like, I don't think any one of us would argue with what Judas had to say. Yeah, she could have sold all that and given it to the poor. I mean, wouldn't that be like a, mm. like a better thing for her to do? I mean, I think all of us initially would be like, yeah, Judas kind of has a point here. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. While we should give to the poor and giving to the mission of Jesus to seek and save this lost world should be of the utmost importance in our lives and in our bank accounts, this does not mean that we should have a poverty mentality when it comes to wealth. Some might also call this a scarcity mentality. Mm -hmm. The heart of poverty wants to make us feel guilty about doing things the right way and succeeding in life. Mm -hmm. Look, if you've got the money to buy that new iPhone, and you've taken care of all your other obligations, and, like, there's nothing inherently sinful about buying the new iPhone. Mm, I don't know. Now, think twice. Could you maybe buy the cheaper version? Or, like, right. could you be more, you know, uh, studious with your finances instead of just, just getting the nicest stuff all the time? Yeah, sure. Mm. But there's nothing inherently wrong. Mm, I don't know. The reality is that it will judge our cars. It will judge our homes. It will judge our... Per a Christian would never own anything like that. Mm. A Christian would never own anything that expensive. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It twists the scripture to make a case that the Bible never makes. Mm. Mm. Historically, the spirit of poverty is rooted in the beliefs of the Gnostics, which was a heretical teaching back in the first century church that said everything physical is evil. And everything spiritual is holy. Mm. But God made the physical, so it can't be evil in and of itself. Physical things, including money, are amoral. Not immoral, amoral. A-M-O-R-A-L, just so that we get the spelling correctly, all right? What does that mean? That means that in and of itself, it's not good or evil. It's what we do with it that makes it good or evil. Right. Mm -hmm. How we use them determines what is right and wrong. 1 Timothy 6.10. I was listening to a, a, a podcast the other day and somebody brought up this path, this phrase. For the love of money is the? True. True. But is that what they said? No. Money is the root of all evil. No. That's not what the scripture says. Remember what I talked about on Friday. What God creates, Satan counterfeits. Yeah. Yeah. So even a little movement of, of wow. two or three words. All of us have swallowed that line, hook, line, and sinker, I guarantee you. Uh -huh. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Notice it says, it doesn't say, is the root of evil. All kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Money isn't the root of evil. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The spirit of poverty has two little sisters, envy and jealousy. Oh, dear. Jealousy says, I want what you have. 
Envy says, I don't think I can get what you have, so I don't want you to have it either. Ooh. All this talk about equality in our world today, I love it. I think it's great, and I think it's necessary. But so much of this talk about equality and equity is rooted in envy. Right. Mm. It's rooted in envy. Mm. I can't get to where you're at, so therefore I don't want you to be there either. Wow. Mm. That's not godly. That's not godly at all. If you see these attitudes taking root in your life, you're dealing with the heart of poverty. How do we avoid the heart of poverty? Well, the answer is in our next point. But first, we've got to never take our theology theology lessons from the world. Always check your assumptions. Always check your perspectives. If they're not in line with the scriptures, guys, the more I preach, the more I realize how lost this world is. And I'm not even talking like salvation. That's an easy one. Mm. I'm just saying how far from the scriptures we've come. Mm. Come on, bro. My dad has a saying. He always says, God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that one before? Some of us who are maybe in the older generation have heard that, I'm sure. Now, I don't disagree that God does help those who like take the initiative and, and, and walk with him. And, right? So there's, there's a level of truth to that phrase. But it's usually somebody quoting scripture. You can't find that in the Bible. There's no Proverbs. You know, there's no book of Eric, chapter 6, verse 3, that says this. It doesn't exist. We never take our theology lessons from the world. This is why I always tell baby Christians, do not read a spiritual book. Yes. Mm. Preach that. Your first year should be nothing but this. Yeah. Right here. That's right. Yeah. Nothing but this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Because if you know this, you can read anything. Right. You can listen to any podcast. You can listen to any YouTube. You can do whatever you want. And now it's filtered through a lens of a biblical worldview. Yeah. You can go, that's garbage. As awesome as Jordan Peterson might be, he says some stuff, and you're like, that I can find in the scriptures. That ain't there. Mm. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You can listen to some really wacky stuff and go, I I can see some truth in this, but this, this, and this aren't right. Right. Uh, But here's what the Bible says about it, so I'm going to follow that. Right. Right. Come on, honey. Biblical worldview, especially when it comes to our finances. Learn your view about wealth from Scripture. Judas complained about Mary's extravagant gift. In reality, his comments were motivated by greed because he was a thief, not because he cared about others. Mm -hmm. But this passage makes it clear that Judas only cared about the money. Mm -hmm. He was a poster child for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Mm -hmm. He was dishonest and stole from the money bag. So how do we fix this? Mm -hmm. We have to have a heart of gratitude. You know, the heart of gratitude recognizes that wealth comes from God and is represented by Mary here in this passage in John 12. It says, what I have is not mine, so I should be thankful. The heart of gratitude reminds us that we are in need of grace and the things that we have are a blessing. Right? I've mentioned this in other lessons, but I said, here in God's kingdom, we don't use people... And make money. We make money. No, that doesn't make any sense, does it? We use money. We don't love money and use people. We love people and use money. There we go. Let me say that again, and I'll edit the wackiness out of the video. We love people and use money. We don't love money and use people. Amen? God put us here. And we should respond to his work in our lives appropriately. Mm. The heart of gratitude reminds us that the things that we own shouldn't own us. We need to use them for God's good and or our good and his glory. Mm. Come on, right? Mary poured perfume, what was worth about a year's wages on Jesus' feet, and then wiped it with her hair. The average income today is about $50,000 a year here in the United States. Mm. That's a lot of perfume. 
Yeah. Especially if you go with one of those, like, you know, you can get those perfumes where you get new ones every month or whatever from the mail, you know what I mean? Like yeah. $9.99 a month. I mean, somebody do the math on that, right? The smell of the perfume, not only did it fill the whole house, but with the way that the breezes blow in, in the Middle East at that time, it probably, the neighbors could have probably smelled it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <clears throat> but she understood that the heart of gratitude requires us to live in such a way that says, thank you, God. Mm. She was so grateful that she didn't mind breaking this jar and putting it at Jesus' feet. Mm. It requires acts of worship for what he has done and is doing and is going to do in our lives. Obedience, generosity, and excellence are natural outcomes of a spirit of gratitude. They are offerings of worship that we make to God when we are thankful. It's not how much we have that matters. It's not how much money we have that matters. But whose it is that matters. We get to choose which of these three hearts we embrace. God loves us enough to give to Jay. You want to choose the spirit of pride? You want to choose a heart of pride? Go for it. You want to choose a poverty mentality, a scarcity mentality? Jesus loves you enough to say, go for it. But he wants us to have a heart of gratitude. We can be Mary, we can be Judas, or we can be Martha. The goal is to be like Mary, to live a life that reflects our gratitude for God. And what he has given us. Amen? Amen. Point number two, the hands of wealth. Come on, bro. The hands of wealth. We're going to dive into, in this la these last two points, talking about four little tiny words. We're going to talk about the now, the then, the us, and the them. Okay. Now, then, us, and them. And this will make sense as we keep going. The hands of wealth. Now, if we're not careful, our God-given wealth can lead us down a wrong road. If we aren't careful, we can find ourselves in a whole lot of trouble in a short amount of time. And again, that's why we need a biblical pattern for how wealth is supposed to work in our lives. We need guidance so that wealth, God's way, can provide a blessing for our families and not a curse. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says this. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. The biblical pattern for wealth moves us through a process. With the right heart, with the heart of gratitude, throughout this process we can receive these blessings and not the curses. This process takes us from a place where we're focused on our immediate needs, the now, to a spot where we can give generously to meet the needs in our community and around the world. It begins with the now, what is immediately in front of us on a daily basis, which is our work. All of us work. Whether you're working to go to school and your job is to get good grades, or whether you're working and going to school where your job is to get good grades and be a good employee, whatever it may be, all of us have work. This is when your head is down, you're focused on getting through each day. This is the stage where most of us are living. I think only one of us is retired in this room, right? Most of us are living, and even, even Rocky still has work to do, you know what I mean? But this is the stage where most of us are. We move from, thank God it's Friday, to, oh no, it's Monday. As soon as I thought about this, I remember a song that came on the radio while I was driving around in Alaska with my brother by a band named Loverboy back in the 80s. Oh, dear. Oh. And there's a phrase in it that says, everybody's working for the weekend. <laughs> right? There it is, Louie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to enjoy life because we're so focused on making a living. And while you're living in the now, your primary focus is on taking care of your family, taking care of yourself, your immediate obligations. But it's okay from a biblical perspective. That's what you're supposed to be doing at this stage. Mm -hmm. But again, not to the detriment, like we saw with, Ma with Martha, not to the detriment of what's more important, right? 1 Timothy 5.8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives 
and especially in our own household, have denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If you're a single person today, who's in your household? You. <coughs> and if you're not able to cover your own personal obligations, it is not right. I mean, we joke about college students living on ramen and stuff like this. Like, that's not right. There's something wrong with that picture. Now, you can, and enjoy it while it lasts, because if I had ramen every day, there would be a much larger version of me in front of you today, and a much sicker version of me in front of you today. Aww. It would not be a good situation. Right. Okay? But the reality is that we should be taking care of ourselves as best we possibly can. It's okay from a biblical perspective to work. You need to take care of those that are closest to you. In this stage where biblical foundations for handling money really take root, this is where getting out of debt, staying on a budget, living on less that you make, saving as much as you can, and giving as generously as circumstances allow is so important. Mm -hmm. And those other passages we looked at with Martha, Martha would have really liked, right? For even if we were with you, we gave you this rule, no one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That is a biblical passage, and it still applies. We just have to apply it the right way, amen? When you follow the basic principles, you start to find some margin in your life, and you can breathe a little bit. But it takes work. You know, last time we looked at the amount of work that it's going to take to get out of debt, <coughs> but that work is not just to get out of debt. It's to take care of your needs and the needs of others so that you begin, you can begin to make progress. Mm -hmm. As you do, your head comes up, and you can start to look around you at the needs that are around you so that you can meet those needs, yeah. and you can start to look to the future to be able to meet the needs of that future vision. You can start to get a vision and plan what the future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But that happens right here, right now. Mm -hmm. It happens in the era of hard work. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. It happens in hard work. Come on. Mm -hmm. The head of wealth. The head of wealth. Now let's talk about then. As the weight of the now starts to lift, right, as we begin to get a little bit more margin in our life, because we are now having some savings, or maybe we've got less debt, and we've got a little bit more wiggle room, we can now begin, and we should obviously look up anyway, because God has got us anyway, we should have a level of peace in our life, from that gratitude that we have what's been given to us, we can now shift and recognize that there's more to what's going on than just what's immediately in front of you. <coughs> then is when you start looking toward the future. You can start developing a vision for your future, developing a future focus. Proverbs 29, verse 18, we're very familiar with this passage. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessing... But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Mm. Old King James Version says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 21, verse 20 says, the wise store up choice food in olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Once you and your family are in a good place financially, and you're starting to gain some confidence and momentum, you can start planning for the future. You can start investing. You can start saving. Some people think that they're living by faith when they're really flying by the seat of their pants. Just living on the edge and claiming to trust God. That's not faith. That's irresponsibility. Real faith involves creating a plan, thinking about what can be done, and then pursuing that plan and pursuing that vision. Once you set in motion your vision for the then and that's in front of you, your peripheral vision allows you to see something better for you and for your family. As your vision continues to expand, you begin to think about what kind of legacy you're building for the next generation. Go to Proverbs chapter 13. Okay. Proverbs chapter 13. Look here in verse 22. The Bible says, A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Wow. We are all building a legacy. But the question is, 
Are you building a legacy for you and your family, your children's children? Or are you building somebody else's legacy? Building a legacy is not just an issue of putting money in some trust fund, but it's about helping your children and then your children's children to have a heart, have the heart, have the hands, and have the head to keep that legacy going on God's way. To build a legacy that makes a positive difference in your family. You must be intentional about <laughs> training your children to handle God's wealth. If you look at Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, Start children off in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not turn from it. Mm. You have to prepare them to pass their own positive legacy to future generations. It's like running, like a runner passing a baton in a relay race. Now again, many of us are like, well, I'm... 18 years old. I don't have kids. What, 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 how does this apply to me? Uh -huh. Begin training yourself. Right. Yeah. Why am I doing three weeks of financial uh, uh, sermons? Because I'm training you. Mm. Why, do we do why do we do budgets when we first landed here? Because Ariel and I are training you. Mm. So that when you get to be 40s <laughs> and your kids... Now start to learn, learn a living. You've been able to train them mm. in the way that they should go. And that's part of building a legacy. Yeah. Wow. During the then stage, you start to see what you can do to change your family tree. You can break free from bad habits and bad decisions that may have been crippling your family for years. Mm. You know, while I was in Alaska, my dad was really big on this Ancestry.com. It's actually... Man, it's a rabbit hole. You can go down and stay yeah. in there real quick. And as we were looking, uh, my dad went all the way back to the 1400s, 1450s, to um, a guy named, uh, I don't have my phone with me. He, he sent it to me. Come on, honey. Let me find it here. <laughs> Powell's von Horam Schramm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he says he says some of them were knights who fought for whoever happened to be in charge. I think they got land holdings for that, and in turn, the people who lived or farmed there came under their control. And he goes on with a couple others. But my family, back in the 1400s, Whoa. were knights of the German Empire at the time, the, the oh. Kingdom of Ger Germany. Wow. Yes, sir. Come on, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> They were wealthy. Wow. They had land. They had title. They had money. Mm. <laughs> Over the years, they immigrated to the United States and to New York mm. before the Revolutionary War. Now, this was all new to me because I had a whole different perspective. They fought <laughs> on the side of the British during the Revolutionary War, which doesn't make me too fired up, but hey, it happens. <laughs> but in so doing, they received land and title and status in Canada. Okay, Canada. Yes. Now, our wealth and our land and our title and our status got lost somewhere on the Oregon Trail because once they came over to the West Coast, we were poor. <laughs> so it's obvious that over the course of a few hundred years, or maybe a few thousand years, right, that wealth can either be passed on and legacy can be continued, or it can be lost in just a couple generations. There's a few books that I've read over the course of the last few years that it takes two generations. This is why God says, your children's children. If it's not blown up by your children, and it's not blown up by your children's children, the chance of that legacy lasting continually, or for a much longer period of time, is much greater. God gives us this command to think long term. Again, not just from a money perspective, but a mindset. Mm. Yeah. Think about how many people win the lottery. Oh, yeah. Almost every single one of them who wins the lottery goes back to being exactly broke, if not worse than they were before they won the lottery. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because it's not an issue of money. Yeah. It's an issue of mindset. Right. Come on, bro. You can't just leave money to a dysfunctional, immature kids because it will ruin them. You need to put safeguards in place. And here's some safeguards to think about. Number one is money makes you more of what you are. It magnifies the person that you are. Wow. 
So if you're a jerk without money, you're going to be a bigger jerk with money. Wow. If you're generous with money, you'll be incredibly generous with more money. Mm. You have to be careful about the person you become because that will be magnified with money. Wow. Wow. This is why it's important to train your children. Mm. But it begins with you. What's your character like? Ownership. Number one, God owns it all. Yeah. We just manage it. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Whoever or whatever you are in charge of, regardless of the amount, belongs to God. Recognizing God's ownership allows you to keep your possessions in the proper perspective. If you really believe that God owns your money, that was his money that you're managing, would you do what you're doing with it right now? It's much easier to handle somebody else's money and property. Mm -hmm. The attitude lets you handle money wisely for God's glory mm -hmm. without having it mess you up. Mm -hmm. And then community. Mm -hmm. You become like the people you hang around. Wow. So be careful about who you spend your time with. Mm. Once you align your own life with these lenses, you need to apply them to other relationships in your life. Do the other people in your life believe that God owns everything? Do they have the character that you want to have? Some of us need to limit the amount of time that we spend with other people in our lives. And, and that includes people that are the closest to us. And I will say this publicly. Some of us need to stop spending so much time with our family. Not because we shouldn't love our family. But because your character right now doesn't have the strength to go into that situation and be the strong one without them influencing you. The Bible said bad company corrupts good character. It doesn't say that you being a good character can go into bad company and help that bad company have good character. It doesn't work that way. It works the opposite way. Like, I, could, I, I, I want nothing more. Let me just be honest. I want nothing more than to be back up in Alaska with my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. But there's only so much <laughs> of the Shram family that I can handle <laughs> to where I start to get influenced. Uh -huh. right. And I'm a preacher. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm supposed to be the strong one here. Uh -huh. No, I can take about 10 days, and then i got to get away. Yeah. It was three days in. My brother's like, hey, man, why don't you come over? I'm like, I'm coming over. Now, luckily, he was, you know, next-door neighbors. You know what I mean? But there's only so much that you can, that you can handle <coughs> until your character is at a place where now you're not influenced by that, and that's not a big deal to you. Mm. Not all of us have Christians in our family. Right. In fact, most of us do not. Right. Mm. Or if they claim to be Christians, they're not biblical Christians. Right. They're pop culture Christians. Mm -hmm. And that can influence us in a great way. Mm -hmm. In marriage, you need to remember that couples can't heal hurts with money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you've got issues in your marriage, money cannot fix the issues. Only God can. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And discipling. Mm -hmm. right. In parenting... Make sure that your kids understand that God owns it all and make sure they carefully choose the people and friends who surround them. Again, you're training them to think a certain way. With extended member, family members and others, maintain proper boundaries to protect your legacy. Some people today think that it's better for Christians to give all of their wealth to nonprofits instead of handing it off to, generationally to their family members. Now, be sh to be sure, we must give generously yeah. Yeah. to God's kingdom, to the church, as well as to Mercy Worldwide. Amen. 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 Right? Amen. Woo. These organizations have benefited greatly from the generosity. We would not be here if it wasn't for men and women giving generously. Right. There would not be a church here. Yeah. It's necessary. That's it. 
And this practice should never stop, but the Bible shows that we shouldn't hesitate to pass our resources to our family if those individuals are trained to handle it well. And the reality is if they're trained to handle it well, you're continuing your giving long after you're gone. Mm. Yeah. Come on, bro. So your legacy shouldn't just be about giving all the money to your, your family, mm. but the legacy also is giving money to the kingdom. Right. right. Giving money to right. nonprofit organizations right. like Mercy Worldwide. Mm. Right. A prime example of this, of positive generational handoff, is the story of King David and his son Solomon. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. Come on. Home stretch, fam. Home stretch. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. Look here in verse 14. David says, I have taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord... A hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron, too great to be weighed, and wooden stone. And you may add to them. You have many workers, stone cutters, masons, and carpenters, as well as those who do skilled in every kind of work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. David couldn't build a temple. God did not allow David to build the temple, although that was David's heart's desire. Yeah, that's so cool. But even though he couldn't build the temple, he provided the money for Solomon to be able to build it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that is interesting is that my legacy, my impact, has the potential to be even greater when I'm gone. Mm -hmm. it, maybe, maybe it's not my job on this earth, in my life, to do X, Y, and Z that I want to do. Yeah. Mm. Maybe that's my son's job. Wow. Mm. Maybe that's my daughter's job. Wow. Mm. I can provide the legacy. Wow. I can provide the funds. I can provide the mentality, the focus, mm. for God to have an even greater impact than I could have through my kids. Mm. Wow. Now think about your spiritual kids. Wow. Mm. Some of you are going to study the Bible with and baptize some of the greatest evangelists and women's ministry leaders that the kingdom of God has ever seen wow. and has ever known. That's going to have a, a tremendously greater impact than you could possibly mm. ever have. Mm. Wow. That's a legacy. Amazing. Wow. In today's money, David contributed $21 billion. Wow. Now, that really isn't a lot of money when we're talking about trillions of dollars that our country is in debt uh, and other things. Again, another sermon for another time. But that still is a lot of money. You know what I mean? Yeah. David understood that his resources were God's resources, and he knew he could trust Solomon. And this is Solomon pre-prayer to God about wisdom. Wow. David had died by that time, and he's like, hey, my servant David is dead. What can I do for you? He's like, I want wisdom. Wow. Because Solomon was trained. David had trained Solomon. Mm -hmm. One of the only sons that he actually did train, if you read the scriptures, unfortunately. Yeah. Wow. So he did a good case study on what not to do and what to do. Oh, there you go. Wow. So David didn't hesitate to give his son the money that he'd saved up to build a temple. In building a legacy for your family, you have to make choices. Mm. You can choose between blessings or curses. Wow. Again, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life that you and your children may live. Mm -hmm. The difference between blessings and curses, life and death, is the decisions that you make during the us stage. Collective decisions for you and your family and those around you. Your choices today will establish a direction for your children to follow. Not just your physical children, but your spiritual children. Mm. Choose life so that you and your family can make a difference for years to come. Finally, let's talk about them. Mm. Now that your vision for your family is in place, in the them stage, your vision broadens, and God allows you to see others' needs that you can meet. Familiar passage to all of us, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, write that down. 
Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Mm. These needs can be down the street or around the world. The key is that you respond to God's leading and give generously to meet the needs of others. I love this quote by Margaret Thatcher, who was uh, Prime Minister of the UK a long time ago. It says, No one would remember the Good Samaritan if he had only good intentions. He had money as well. Wow. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> the Good Samaritan was known as the Good Samaritan, not just because he's like, oh man, homie is like hurting. Uh -huh. uh, I guess I could pick him up and give him wine and put stuff on his, his wounds and put him on my donkey and take him to the inn and then like drop him off and walk away. No, what, what, what's the legacy? Right. He paid for it and said, hey, if he requires more, I'll, when I come back, I'll pay for that. Mm. Wow. Poor people can't meet the financial needs of poor people. Mm. Now, the reality is that they can. Mm. It's your definition of poor. Mm. Are any of us poor here? No. 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 Not even close. Because I guarantee you, all of us make more than $11,000 a year. Mm. And that means all of us are in the upper 5%, I would guarantee. If not, like, you know, the, 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 the world likes to talk about the 1%. All of us are the 1%. <laughs> wow. When we talk about the world's economy. Wow. Wow. You have to build wealth and let God use you to fulfill his plans wow. with his resources. A great book that I would highly highly, highly recommend is called Thou Shalt Prosper by Rabbi Daniel Lapin. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I've been in the process of reading it for a couple weeks. And then in his book, he shares that each Sabbath, Jewish families observe a special ceremony known as Havdalah. During the Havdalah observation, a member of the family pours wine into a cup placed on a saucer. The one who pours allows the cup to fill, even to overflow the lip of the cup. This lets some of the wine collect in the saucer below. In the ceremony, the cup represents the resources dedicated to the family. So filling the cup represents a commitment to make sure that all of the family's needs are met during the weeks to come. We work with God to determine how big our cup should be. We don't want it too small so that our family's needs don't get met, but we also don't want it so big that we become selfish and self-centered. Mm. Meanwhile, the overflow that runs into the saucer represents resources dedicated to meet the needs of other people. While the cup is filled, some of what God has provided is set aside to minister outside of the family. Amen. And while we meet needs for our family, we can plan for generous overflow that will allow us to minister to others for God's glory. Now, before I close out, let me share. This is a process, and we like to think of a process in linear fashion. Boom, then this, then this, then this. Here's the thing. God wants us to do all of these all at the same time. Yeah. But it's going to look differently. It's going to look differently than now is also the them, is also the us, is also the them. Because if all I'm doing is focusing on the now, and my head is down, and I'm not paying attention to anybody else around me, mm. is that a godly perspective? No. 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 If I'm only thinking about my future, if I'm only thinking about my legacy, if I'm only thinking about down the road, is that a godly perspective? No. no. If I'm only thinking about my family and not thinking generously and mm. how I can give, love, and serve, and, and special missions and giving and all these things, is that God? No. No. And is only looking out for the interests of, the, of, of other people and making sure other people are taken care of and other people and other people and other people, is that healthy? No. Is that God? No. No. All of it. Right. All of it. You know, for Men's Midweek, I'm going to preach a lesson called... The man who does it all. Mm -hmm. The man who does it all. And so you're welcome to look at that on YouTube in a couple weeks when it's up there. But 
the reality is that we're called to live like this because all the Bible applies to us all the time. Wow. Now, that might look differently. Your legacy might not be, get, like for me, I got two kids. I'm in my 40s. My legacy looks different than Malik, who's 18, no kids, and, you know, has a you know, $600 rent payment. You know what I'm saying? Right. His legacy is getting educated, being the best employee that he can be. Being the best student that he can be. Being the best Bible talk leader that he can be. Training up the men and women that God has put in his life. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mine is different. So I have to look differently. But that doesn't mean we follow this linear process. Now, we are going to follow the linear process, and, but it's also not linear. Does this make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 12. We'll wrap up here. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. Genesis chapter 12. Look here in verse 3. This can be either encouraging or discouraging, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully it'll be encouraging to us, amen? <laughs> Genesis chapter 12, look here in verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. The Bible says that God blessed Abraham, and then that Abraham would use, that he would use Abraham to bless the world. We are also blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. Mm. Now then, us and them, along with the right heart, gives us a biblical framework for wealth, for handling money God's way. Mm. This process can bless our own lives, the lives of our family members, and the lives of others around us. And it will make a difference now and for years to come. Mm. My family, let's get our financial lives on track God's way. Mm. Yeah. Let's get our heart in the right place. God's way. Let's get our hands working hard for wealth God's way. Let's get our head thinking of ways to build and train a legacy in our families and in ourselves God's way. And let's follow God's biblical framework for wealth. I love you all very, very much. Amen.